Hey guys, welcome back to the first Q&A of 2013. Today is Q&A number 116. And before I get started, I want to thank all you guys who sent some very nice condolences in regards to my brother-in-law who passed away recently. I really appreciate that, and so did my sister and her family. Before I get started today, here's a quick look at an older Articat kitty cat. This is an older one. It's got the two-stroke motor made by Articat. I did film a video on how to clean the carburetor on this machine. You're going to see that soon, I hope. It takes a lot of time to edit video, so I'm not quite sure exactly when that video will come out. But anyways, it's a cute little machine. In my first question today, YouTuber asked me, how come there's so much snowblower stuff right now in your videos? Well, that's because where I live in Canada, we have snow. It's winter time here. And I try to kind of keep everything within the season of where I live. So that's why you see a lot of snowblower stuff, but I'm going to try to throw in a few ATV videos in there and chainsaw stuff as well, even though it's the winter time. However, most of the questions I get in the winter time are related to snowblower problems, and that's why you see more snowblower stuff. And my first question is about a snowblower again. A YouTuber emailed me the other day saying he put a new carb kit in his snowblower and it still drips gas out of the carburetor. It's a Tecumseh engine. Now one thing that you may want to check if that's still happening is the float inside the carb. What you want to do is grab the float, shake it. If you hear noise inside or liquid, which would end up being gas obviously, then the float needs to be replaced. If it's got fuel in it, it's not going to go up like it should or float on the fuel inside the carb and it will not be shutting the needle valve to prevent it from allowing more fuel in the carb. So it's just going to sit down and then all the fuel is going to keep coming in the carb and it's going to drip out the air intake. They're very cheap to replace, they're usually around 10 bucks, and it can solve all your problems. A YouTuber asked me the other day, what's the difference between the red Loctite and the blue Loctite, and do you use it in your shop? Well, obviously I do use it in my shop. As you can see, I have a big container of the blue stuff and a small one of the red, and it gets used almost on a daily basis. First of all, I'll start by explaining why I use the blue Loctite. I use this one because it's usually bolts or screws that I'm going to be removing. As it says here, it's removable. So this is not a permanent Loctite solution for your nuts and bolts. It does stop them from coming off, but it's not going to be too hard to remove the nuts or bolts that you use this Loctite on. Whereas with the red Loctite, it's more of a permanent solution. As you can see, it says permanent strength here on it. Now you're still going to be able to remove screws or bolts or nuts, whatever you've used this red stuff on. However, they're just going to be a bit harder than if you had used the blue stuff. And by the way, this stuff comes in really handy on snowblowers and snowblower engines, especially like that Tecumseh engine over there. So because these engines and the snowblowers, they're on vibrate so much, it's really wise to use this stuff when you put nuts and bolts back on. So I do recommend to keep a good supply of this stuff in your shop. I obviously use the blue one more often, that's why I have a bigger container of it. It is fairly expensive, so use it wisely. Another question I get is, why is my Briggs opposed twin engine surging up and down? Well, what could be causing this obviously is a bad gas, a dirty carburetor, and so forth. But I've seen these engines surge up and down even though the carburetor was clean and it had good gas. But what I found really helped to stop this problem was a new carb kit. And the part number is 694056. What I'll do is put a link to where you can buy one online in case you need this carb kit for yourself. Anyways, it's gonna come with a lot of different gaskets. All you have to do is match up your old one with a new one. In this case, on this carburetor, the previous people who had worked on it did not put in the proper gasket. They had put in this one with the circular hole, when in fact it should have had a gasket like this with this type of hole, so it was restricting a lot of the airflow through the carburetor. So I put in the proper gasket. Also, I replaced the adjusting screw. There was only one on that carburetor, and it was missing the O-ring that went into the carb with this screw. And that screw is located right here. Now, another thing you may want to do is if your engine surges up and down before you put in a new carb kit, is turn out this screw if you have it on your carburetor. Some of the new carburetors may not have that screw there. But anyways, coming back to the screw is I put in a new o-ring with it and the brass washer put it back in and that really helped to keep the idle at a steady level. It used to go up and down, up and down, it was really annoying. 
And there was a new needle valve in there as well. This is the old one. And I did replace this seat. Here it is. I'll make a video one day showing you guys how to take this out of a carburetor. And it also had the diaphragms for the fuel pump as well. And the fuel pump is located right here. So I replaced all the diaphragms in there and some of the parts in the carburetor. And now it does not surge up and down. And like I mentioned, all you have to do is match up the gasket that's in your carburetor. Make sure it's the right one though. And with all the extra parts, just save them. You never know when you're going to need them for another repair in the future. In my next question, a YouTuber asked me, why does my snowblower auger belts keep breaking like this? And I have an example here in the shop to show you why that may be happening. So here I have the blower, I've got the belts off. Now everything may look good. You might think, well, I'm just going to put new belts and it's going to be okay. But if you look closely down here, you're going to see when I grab the snowblower handles to tip up the snowblower, that it's rotted over here and disconnected partially from the back end. Just like this. So take a good look, you can see it's separating. So it's almost like a hinge effect. You can see here that the auger pulleys are not moving in conjunction with the auger housing. So that will cause the belt to come off. The reason for that is it's not going to be aligned with the auger pulleys on the housing. Because this is a totally separate part from the back end. They're totally independent from each other, so if it's rotted down here like I showed you, it's just causing major problems. The belt will come off of here, get caught somewhere in there, and snap. Sometimes it may not snap, but you will damage your belts continually. And by the way, this is the MTD part number 7540430. You may see the letter B at the end as well on the OEM belts. Now, Rotary does make a good aftermarket belt. It's part number 12-12429 and these belts are 3 8 by 35 inches. It's an exact replacement of the OEM belts. I did talk about this subject in my video called what to look for when buying a used snowblower. I mentioned that sometimes the auger body can rot or even the snowblower itself and cause everything to fall apart. So what I'll do is put the link to that video underneath this video. Make sure to go look at it before you buy any used snowblower. I've seen people buy used snowblowers only to end up with the problem I just showed you on this machine and it's very expensive to repair. The proper repair is to replace the whole front auger housing. If you weld it, it's going to break again somewhere else and cause the same problem. And again another question I got on this subject is in regards to the plastic cover. Somebody told me that the belts are chewing a hole right through this cover. That could be happening if somebody replaced the belts and put some in that are a bit too long for your machine. It could also be caused if your body is rotted somewhere else and causing the belts to get too loose. So make sure you check everything including the integrity of the metal of your snowblower because it could cause that problem as well. Now remember that this is a sacrificial part. It's meant to be there to keep the belts from coming off the Yager pulley there. It's only about 10 to $15 to replace this part here. I can actually put a link to where you can buy one online. I'll do that for this video today as well. So if it's true to haul, buy a new cover. If it happens again, then you have to investigate and make sure that everything's good on your blower, including that you have the proper belts. Another question I got the other day is in regards to the ethanol in the fuel that we buy today. In most countries, there will be ethanol in the fuel and it tells you the percentage on the fuel pump when you buy it. While some YouTubers are asking me if that's causing an issue in outdoor power equipment and if I've noticed an increase in carburetor problems over the years because of that. Well, my answer to that is yes, definitely. I've seen a lot more problems, including water in carburetors, in fuel tanks, even in equipment that's been stored properly in a garage. So I'm not a fuel expert, but I do know it's causing more issues and even the small engine industry will tell you that. You just have to Google it. You're going to find a lot of stuff and reasons why this is happening with fuel that contains ethanol. Some people have told me that the higher the octane is in the fuel, the less ethanol may actually be in that fuel. So all I can tell you for sure today is that it is causing problems. 
A YouTuber asked me the other day, should I use Kevlar belts in outdoor power equipment? Well, my answer to that is definitely yes, because the Kevlar belts are much stronger than just ordinary belts that you may use on a compressor, for example. For example, here's a belt that would cost about a third the price of an actual Kevlar belt. This is a belt you could use on an air compressor or a drill press, usually on something that doesn't require too much strength to turn around. Whereas this belt here is a Kevlar belt, usually it's going to say on the package if it's Kevlar or it may be written in fine print at the back or if it even says it's for outdoor power equipment then you know it's made of Kevlar. So if you put a belt like this on outdoor power equipment it's not going to last half as long as a belt like this. So guys thanks again for watching today. I want to thank you for all your support in the year 2012 and hopefully this year will be just as good or better. So have a great weekend guys and I'll see you in two weeks.